Good morning. Welcome to the first of a four-part series. This is Victoria Beal with the Ohio LTAP Center, and I have with me my colleague Ron Eck from the West Virginia LTAP Center. And he, I would have introduced him last week as the former director of the West Virginia LTAP Center, but Ron has been reappointed to that position. So he is once again the current director of the LTAP Center. We're so glad to have him back in the fold with us as a part of the LTAP community across the nation. Um, he is going to present for you today on ADA self-evaluation and transition plans and an overview of the elements of PROAG. So before we get things started, a couple of housekeeping items. I would ask if you haven't done so yet, please look for the question box in the GoToWebinar panel. And I always ask everyone to please drop me a hi or hello in there just to make sure you remember where it's at if you've been on here before or if you haven't been that you find it because this is how we're going to accept questions from you on the webinar today and all of our sessions regarding this topic. Um, we ask you to please put the questions in and periodically Ron will be stopping to ask me for questions that are in the box and I'll read off what's in there for him. Also, at the end of the webinar, I will send him a full list of the questions that have been asked and ask that he please, at the very end of the series, provide us back to some um, answers on the general questions. So we are happy to have you on here and hopefully you'll be able to make all of the sessions because it'll give you credit for this complete course through our LTAP program. Um, another item housekeeping wise is in the handout section of your GoToWebinar. Uh, panel, there should be three items. We have for you a copy of today's slides. We also have for you um, a list of resources and an additional document that the name starts with Village Lions. Um, and Ron will discuss those with you in more detail later on. But um, those are there for you to download anytime while the webinar is running. I will send out a follow-up email with links to those documents as well. So if for some reason your computer doesn't let you download them, um, don't worry, you'll get a link to where the document's at. And while folks are still saying hi or hello in that question box, I'm gonna go ahead and launch a poll question real quick that we'd like to ask that you respond to. And if you for some reason can't get the answer to record on your screen, it's because you're in full screen mode so just take yourself out of full screen mode by hitting escape um, and then answer the question if you wouldn't mind. But we'd like to know what your work affiliation is. Are you with a state agency, a local government agency? And there we wanna know 50 or more or less on um, the number of employees. And then of course our partners in the private sector and you know definitely our partners, the educational institutions are with Federal Highway. So as folks are putting those answers in there and we've got quite a few who voted already Ron um, I'm gonna mention to the one person who's already raised their hand um, that we def we are not taking questions through the raised hand function so please look for the question box and put a higher hello in there just so you know where it's at and with that um, I'm gonna go ahead and close that poll down and let you know Ron who we've got on here today it looks like and I'm gonna share these results the overwhelming group is local government agencies of 50 or more employees. That's 50% of our audience today. Um, we have 23% from the private sector, 16% from state agencies, 10% from local government agencies of um, 50 or less employees, and then 1% from the educational institutions, federal highway or other. So you've got a great mix there, Ron. Great. Yeah, I like that variety. Hopefully we'll have some good questions, good discussion, good interaction. Great. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself now and it's all yours. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this session on ADA self-evaluations and transition plans and an overview of the elements of PROAG. As Victoria said, I'm Ron Eck with the West Virginia LTAP program. You have my email there. So if during or after this, these four sessions, questions or concerns come up about ADA or about any of the issues we're talking about, uh, feel free to shoot me an email. I'm always glad to try to respond. Just briefly, a little bit about my background so you know where I'm coming from. I'm a civil engineer. 
uh, traffic and transportation engineer, primarily interested in, and my background's in roadway safety, roadway design, pedestrians, and, and pedestrian safety. I spent most of my career at West Virginia University in Morgantown, West Virginia, which is where I'm sitting right now in terms of offering this session. Uh, then about 12 years ago, I retired from the university. I, I, I love LTAP. I was director of the LTAP program in West Virginia at that time. I love LTAP, so I do training in West Virginia, around the country. Uh, a lot of, was doing a lot of in-person training before the pandemic. Uh, and, and as Victoria mentioned, just recently I've been, went back uh, to help out and am again the director of the West Virginia Center. But probably most significant for this class is a number of years ago, I had the opportunity to spend a week outside of Baltimore, Maryland in one of the suburbs on a Federal Highway Administration train the trainer class on the Americans with Disabilities Act. It was a pretty intense week. In the morning, we were listening to the experts who would lecture to us. In the evenings after dinner, we would have to lecture to the experts and they would critique us in terms of our presentation. But for me, the best part was the afternoons. We were out and about on the streets and sidewalks of this Baltimore suburb in wheelchairs. They blindfolded us and gave us canes. We had low vision goggles. And it was just a great experience to sort of simulate the challenges and the issues faced by individuals with disabilities. Obviously, we can't do that in this format, but if you ever get the opportunity to do that, even if it's just to sit in a wheelchair and you know go for a for one block or so, I encourage you to do that because it really makes you aware of some of the issues that uh, we'll be talking about today or that affect those with disabilities. So let's see if I can get my screen to move. Not sure why I'm hung up here. Let me get out of this. Hmm. I find sometimes just using the arrow buttons on the keyboard works. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. It's not working, huh? Okay. Usually after one or two, maybe I should exit and escape and try again here. Sounds good to me. It, it looks like one of the tools from GoToWebinar is on, and I honestly don't use those tools myself, so I couldn't tell you how to turn them off. But don't worry, folks. We'll be running here in a minute. Yeah. Huh. I can't even escape here. Do you want to stop screen sharing? Yeah, that's and then probably what I'll do is stop screen share here. That's fine. No problem. Hmm. First comes to worst, I can always load up your uh, PDF and move it for you. I think we're all set, so let's see. Okay. All right. Can you all see my screen now? I can. Okay, I apologize for that. Oh, no worries. Other people can see it too, they let us know. Okay, there Great. we go. Thanks, Ron. This is what I hope you'll get out of the four sessions, but that is by Thursday of next week. Uh, the course is really in two parts. This week we'll talk about ADA self-evaluations and transition plans and associated matters, and then next week we'll do an overview of the public rights-of-way accessibility guidelines. So after tomorrow, I hope you'll be able to identify a local agency's responsibilities under ADA Section 504 and other laws. And I hope you'll be able to create or revise a self-evaluation transition plan for your agency's facilities in the public right-of-way. And you may see that acronym quite a bit over the next four classes. That's my acronym for the public right-of-way, P-R-O-W. That's the sidewalks, the crosswalks, the traffic signals, the roundabouts, the on-street parking, the uh, street furniture that you might have in your downtown business district, 
all of those things are part of the public right of way that most of you deal with probably on a daily basis. Uh, hopefully most of you that are with public agencies, hopefully you have a transition plan. If not, hopefully this class will get you going toward getting that transition plan prepared. That's why I say create a plan. Uh, maybe you have one, but it hasn't been updated or revised in a number of years. Uh, so hopefully after this session, you'll be able to take steps to, to see where you stand in the process and begin revising or updating your transition plan. Then next week, after that, those sessions, I hope you'll be able to identify the relevant compliance standards in terms of widths and cross slopes and grades, curb ramps, those sorts of things, such that by the end of the class, I hope you'll be able to evaluate an existing, meaning out on a sidewalk or street facility or a planned facility. If you're reviewing a set of plans, you'll be able to evaluate that or those plans for compliance with PROAG. Quickly, uh, the agenda of what we'll talk about over these four days. Today will be kind of the background and introduction to ADA, a very brief history of ADA. Talk a little bit about enforcement and some significant court cases. And I don't mean this in the sense of, you know, using this as a threat for anybody, but just to describe kind of what can happen if we don't take this topic seriously. And then we'll talk about self-evaluations today before we quit. Then tomorrow we will talk about transition plans and related matters. We'll talk a little bit about maintaining facilities, which ADA requires us to do. We can't just build something and forget about it. We have to keep it maintained in accessible and operable condition. Then we'll do a transition plan case study. Victoria mentioned one of the files you've been provided, a PDF, is the Village of Lyons, New York, transition plan. We're going to use this as a case study. Uh, we'll go through it and I'll do a little critique of it and maybe get your feedback on it. And then we'll wrap up tomorrow with what I call your to-do list or your agency's to-do list. You can see where you stand in this process and what you might need to do, or maybe you're in good shape. But anyway, we'll, we'll go over that to-do list. And then next week, a week from today, we'll get into the overview of PROAG. We'll start by comparing PROAG and ADAG. And if you're not familiar with either one of those, that's fine. We'll talk about what they are. Then we'll get into the pedestrian access route, as it's called, or the PAR, which deals with uh, many of the requirements of ADA in terms of width and grade and cross slope, surface condition, and that sort of thing. Then we will discuss curb ramps, and then our final day, next Thursday, will be a potpourri of a number of different topics. We'll spend some time looking at detectable warnings, and I know people always have a number of questions about that. So we'll look at detectable warnings, and then we'll kind of do a quick review of crosswalks and median islands, roundabouts and turn lanes, a little bit about APS, accessible pedestrian signals, a little bit about street furniture and on-street parking, and then we'll wrap up with temporary traffic control. I want to note that this, the sessions next week, we're condensing what's normally a full day worth of class into three, hour, three hours worth, so it will be condensed. And I realize today and tomorrow, talking about enforcement and ADA requirements and things, court cases can be a little dry, so what I've done here is periodically in the presentation today and tomorrow, you'll see a photo slide with the caption, what do you think? And I just intersperse these to maybe generate some discussion or some thought about a particular ADA issue. Sometimes they'll be tied to the topic we're talking about, other times not. So this is one, uh, I probably won't tell you where they are. Uh, I, I will tell you, this is a West Virginia city. If any of you were at the work zone class that I did last week, ADA and work zones, you may recall I showed this as one of the case studies. But what this is, very quickly, uh, the gas company, you can see probably a day or two before I took this picture, had been here. They removed a section of sidewalk to repair a gas line, and then they backfilled it, and they put this stone that you see, 
And then the way they work, it's probably similar in your part of the country as well, but they give what they call a ticket to a concrete contractor with whom they have a contract. And that concrete contractor has three weeks to come in and restore the finished concrete surface of the sidewalk. But the point to be made here is notice in this condition, that loose stone is not an accessible surface. Someone in a wheelchair or probably someone with a walker would have great difficulty or maybe not be even able to traverse that sidewalk. So in this up to three week period, that sidewalk would be not traversable, or not accessible. So what might be some solutions? One might be to use some sort of planking or steel plate over that surface. Another might be to maybe the gas company needs to change its procedure and rather have than have the uh, stone here, maybe they should put the surface as some sort of uh, you know, a cold mix asphalt material or something that not intended to be you know long term or permanent, but at least for the week or two or three until the uh, concrete can be restored, at least it's a traversable surface for wheelchairs. So there may be a number of different solutions here uh, to, to look at. But a couple other things to look at. Notice, even if this was normal concrete here, like a broom finished concrete, notice the property owner here has allowed that shrub to grow out over the sidewalk. So I'm not sure, I don't think there is sufficient width here to uh, for a wheelchair or other users to get through. So there's also that issue. And if you have sharp eyes and look in the background here, it looks like the gas company is down on the next block and it looks like they've parked a small dump truck right on the sidewalk, which is, is blocking the sidewalk. So if you're in a wheelchair, if you have a vision impairment on this section of sidewalk or this part of town in this community, you're gonna have some real difficulties at least during the period we see here. Quickly, a background or history of ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. There were a number of predecessors to ADA, maybe the most significant and a significant act in the United States, of course, was the Civil Rights Act of 1964. But interestingly, it did not mention individuals with disabilities. Then in 1968, Congress passed the Architectural Barriers Act or ADA which said that all new federal facilities must be accessible. So federal courthouses and other federal buildings as of 1968 had to be accessible. The Rehabilitation Act of 1973, particularly section 504, was quite significant for us in public works. And one of the things it said basically that programs and facilities funded with federal dollars had to be accessible. So this is the first time curb ramps were required. And many of you may recall back in the late 70s, early 80s, if a, say a, a town or a city got a streetscape grant or something like that, or a roadway project, curb ramps were installed as part of that project. Uh, looking back in hindsight, many times they didn't comply, of course, or don't comply with the current standards. But it's important to note, I think the first requirement for curb ramps in in the public right of way was back in 1973, which is what, 47 years ago. So the, the curb ramps are not a new requirement. Then in July of 1990, President H.W. Bush signed the Americans with Disabilities Act into law. So notice we're about a month away from the 30th anniversary of ADA. So this is probably a good time for public entities to sort of step back and maybe take stock of where do they stand in terms of accessibility in their community or in their entity. It is a civil rights act, so it's a little different maybe than the law that many of us deal with in our public works activities, which is typically tort law, where somebody may sue the municipality or sue the state government because they've been injured in a car crash or in a pedestrian fall or something like that. This is different. Civil rights law is intended, as I say there, to provide equal opportunity for individuals with disabilities. In other words, to prevent discrimination against 
individuals with disabilities. So if someone files a civil rights suit or an ADA suit against a community or a state agency regarding accessibility, they're not really seeking compensation the way that a plaintiff might be in a tort claim. They're looking for getting the system or the infrastructure improved so that things are accessible to everyone with disabilities. And notice there, under ADA, all programs and new and altered facilities, regardless of the funding source, must be accessible. So even if there's no federal dollars involved, the facilities still have to be accessible. And you'll see this acronym a number of times over the next few days. The US DOJ, of course, that's the United States Department of Justice. They have the ultimate compliance responsibility when it comes to ADA, and I'll talk more about that here in a few minutes. I think you all know ADA is quite comprehensive. It covers employment, telecommunications, the private sector. Uh, we're not going to get into all those things. It's probably fair to say everybody who's here today is either with a state or local government or with a private or other entity that does work for or with state and local governments. So our interest is going to be Title II of ADA because that is what addresses state and local governments. But even Title II, you can see, gets into employment and other things as well. Our focus, though, is going to be on subparts D and E. Subpart D is program accessibility, and subpart E is communications. And when you see the word program in the, in the ADA or other documents like this, that's meant in the broadest sense. So a program not only includes, for example, maybe a community's, maybe a community has a summer parks and rec program for youth or for senior citizens or something. Those are certainly part of a program. Or someone's ability to attend a town council meeting or a public hearing or to vote. We're getting into voting season, so that's a big deal now for counties. Those are all programs, but also for those of you who are engineers or technicians or technical types here in the audience, program means also sidewalks, crosswalks, traffic signals, roundabouts, on-street parking. So when you see the word program, it's beyond what we might normally think of a program. That program includes the uh, public right-of-way and the built environment. And then subpart E, communication. So let's look at each of those. This is what subpart D says, for new construction and alterations. And would we agree that's probably when it's easiest to make something accessible is when we're newly designing and constructing it. But notice also the word shall in there, mandatory condition. Each facility shall be designed and constructed in such a way that the facility is readily accessible to and usable by individuals with disabilities. So that's sort of the bottom line that the US DOJ would look at if they're evaluating a community's, let's say, compliance with PROAG, for example. This is actually the same community I showed you a little while ago. In fact, it's just down the street from that slide. Uh, but notice you see a corner here, the curb ramp, a couple of things. For one, maybe not an ADA violation, but notice the crosswalk doesn't line up with the sidewalk. A pedestrian has to make an out of direction uh, jog in their path here to reach the crosswalk. This may be an issue for visually impaired. It's hard to see the sidewalk here at the right side, but it looks like the curb might be missing. So a blind pedestrian using a cane, they would be looking for a curb to tell them they're crossing the street. Or absent a curb, they're looking for a detectable warning surface, the, the truncated domes. And absent those, they might just walk right out into the street because the curb is missing, their cue is missing. And they're probably also outside of the crosswalk in addition to that. Notice here at the ramp, or at the crosswalk, there's no detectable warning surface. The ramp looks to me to be too steep. And then notice over here, if I'm headed for this crosswalk on the left side, and I'm in a wheelchair, I essentially have to come like this and probably go outside of the protection of the crosswalk with my back to traffic 
to get into this crosswalk. And the same thing would apply in reverse there, although at least I'm facing traffic if I'm coming this way. So there's a number of issues at this corner. Subpart E, communications. The bottom line here is the last few words of this sentence or this requirement from the CFR. Communications with members of the public with disabilities must be as effective as communication with others. What's an example of that? Here's an example. That's an official sign, right? I've had people tell me, what's wrong with that? That sign is in the MUTCD. That's a compliant sign. And I, I agree with that. It is a compliant sign. The problem is that sign discriminates against the blind. They cannot see that sign. They cannot access the information on that sign. So if you're closing a sidewalk, and apparently I don't think they've started work yet, but they're going to be closing this sidewalk for some sort of maintenance or utility operation. If you're closing the sidewalk, you can have the sign, but you also need to have a detectable barricade here to let the visually impaired know that they cannot proceed any further and hopefully give them some guidance as to how to proceed. So it looks like we're at a corner here. I'd want the barricade to be close to the corner so that the visually impaired and all pedestrians can cross at the crosswalk here, probably to the other side of the street. And we'll talk more about all of these things. What about ADA, the law or the act? Uh, one of the predecessors to ADA was what's called UFAS. Maybe some of you are familiar with that, the Uniform Federal Accessibility Standards. I believe they were the first sort of federal accessibility standards. Uh, there may still be a few federal agencies today that rely on UFAS, but from our perspective in the public right-of-way, we don't need to concern ourselves with that, other than that you may see reference to that in certain documents. The Americans with Disabilities Act Accessibility Guidelines, or ADAG, also known as the 2010 ADA Design Standards, if you, if you printed out your handout and, or taking notes, you may want to make a note that ADAG, the 2010 ADA standards, those are the current law when it comes to ADA. So ADAG is the current law when it comes to ADA. The issue or the problem for those of us in public works is that ADAG is intended for buildings and on-site facilities what some people call, say, vertical construction or parking lots. ADAG does not address many of the issues in the public right-of-way. For example, ADAG does not address crosswalks. ADAG does not address traffic signals. ADAG does not address on-street parking. ADAG does not address roundabouts. So that's an issue or concern for us in public works. So in, I believe the first edition came out in 2002, the U.S. Access Board developed and issued PROAG, the Public Rights of Way Accessibility Guidelines. And you can see by its name, Public Rights of Way, it does address the issues in the public right of way that concern us, crosswalks, signals, on-street parking. One of the issues, though, with PROAG, and we're currently under the 2011 version of PROAG, is that PROAG is still in draft form. It's still in the rulemaking process, so it's not yet law. But the recommendation of the Department of Justice, the recommendation of the Federal Highway Administration, my recommendation, and even the courts through their actions are telling us that we should be using PROAG. So my recommendation is in your new design and construction work that we be using PROAG. In fact, many state DOTs and local agencies, local governments around the country have already adopted PROAG. So in those entities, they, PROAG is the, the standard, so to speak. But I realize at times it, this can get a little complicated where you have PROAG and ADAG and a, a public entity will have to really follow both. In the public right of way, you'll need to follow PROAG but for example, in City Hall, or if you have a your larger city where you have an office building for the city employees, those built in those structures 
buildings and on-site facilities will have to go under ADAG. And as we'll talk about probably next week, sometimes where those interface between the public right-of-way and private property, sometimes that's where we do run into some issues. Another term that you may hear or encounter in this field is technical infeasibility. That means that in trying to comply with the PROAG or ADA criteria, you find that for some reason you may not be able to, to do so. Uh, for example, let me give an example. Like in, in my community where I am now, Morgantown, West Virginia, a few years ago, they undertook a uh, big streetscape program on our main street in town in the business district. And I believe before the streetscape project, a number of the sidewalks, at least on one side of the street, had excessive cross slope. So the thought was, well, we'll just reduce the elevation, lower the sidewalk on the building side of the sidewalk to give us the flatter cross slope. But once they got in and started construction, it was learned that there were rooms and vaults and coal storage facilities and things from these buildings that actually extended under the sidewalk. And so by lowering the sidewalk, say by a foot next to the building, you were actually interfering with the use of these buildings and these vaults and so forth. That to correct that, you'd almost have to purchase those buildings, demolish them, and ADA does not intend for us to do that. So that's a case where it's technically, it may be technically infeasible to have a 2% cross slope on the sidewalk on that side of the street, because to do so would require you know, purchasing and demolishing buildings. So a couple of things to keep in mind with technical infeasibility. You still, the agency still needs to provide an alternate access route to the maximum extent feasible. In fact, we probably should highlight that second bullet there. That's sort of the bottom line. That's what DOJ and enforcement agencies are going to look at if, if there'd be a complaint or something in your community or a lawsuit. They're going to ask, did that community or did that entity provide a, you know, an accessible facility to the maximum extent feasible? And to be able to demonstrate that, we have to have good documentation. So it's important that these technical infeasibilities, or these some people call them design exceptions, that they be documented. And you'll probably hear me over the next few days, you may get tired of be saying it, but I'll often say document, document, document. That is a key part of this process. Document with you know, some notes or sketches. Photographs are great too to sort of show before and after condition, what you encountered before and what your solution was. Enforcement, maybe not a pleasant topic, but we should talk about it. I mentioned earlier that the main compliance agency is the Department of Justice. Fortunately, in these accessibility complaints or suits, uh, they try to reach settlement negotiations first. And then if those are unsuccessful, then there may be a federal lawsuit. Notice there's a $55,000 civil penalty for the first offense in these matters. Also, the US Department of Transportation is involved in enforcement. And from most of our cases being in roads and streets, that agency would be the Federal Highway Administration, FHWA. They have Office of Civil Rights that receives complaints. Uh, also, of course, in each state, they have division offices, and those offices would investigate complaints. But they also do things like they provide technical assistance and uh, assist with other compliance activities. But Federal Highway Administration may investigate a complaint that might be filed against a local or state agency. Then we have the U.S. Access Board. That's the federal agency that develops and issues ADAG and PROAG and other things under the ADA and other laws. You can see the first sort of guidelines and requirements were issued in 1982. ADAG was first published in 1991. I think I mentioned that we are currently using or operating under 
the 2010 ADA designed standards. PROAG, still in draft form, but we're under the 2011 version. And I'm not sure when it will be signed into law, but as I think I mentioned earlier, that's really, to me, sort of a moot point at this point, because we really need to be using PROAG when we're working in the public right of way. And then citizens and citizens groups, obviously they're not enforcement agencies, but they're part of this process because the citizens or you know, groups that represent maybe folks with certain types of disabilities, they may be involved because they are probably the ones that are going to be filing complaints or lawsuits that sort of trigger or start this process. So they're obviously a key part of the, the whole enforcement uh, structure or system. And I just wanted to say, before we get into the technical details, just wanted to mention some of the impairments that affect people's abilities to access facilities and programs and services. There's, of course, the physical orthopedic impairments that may require people to use a wheelchair or a cane or a walker or something. And one thing about this, of course, is that because folks have an assistive device, it's pretty easy for the rest of the population, whether it's pedestrians or drivers, we can see that someone has a disability because they're using an assistive device. Another category of impairments would be the physical, medical, you know, cardiopulmonary types of conditions or diabetes. But here, probably most of these individuals do not use any sort of assistive device. So they, to us, they just look like a normal, another normal pedestrian or able-bodied pedestrian. Uh, vision, we have two categories, of course, blindness and blind pedestrians use probably one of two methods to navigate. I think the iconic method that we're all familiar with would be the service animal or the dog guide. But the truth is a relatively small percentage of, of blind people use the dog. Most blind individuals use the long cane or the white cane to navigate in the built environment. And what they do is they swing the cane in an arc in front of them and they're looking for shorelines, things that they can detect with the cane. So a curb or a wall or a storefront, those are all detectable and they are used as shorelines. But there's a, another category of vision impairments called low vision. And these individuals are not legally blind, but their vision is so poor that they cannot see fine details. They can, could not read signs, for example. In fact, if they were looking at a, a vehicle to try to make eye contact with a motorist, they couldn't do that because they, they probably couldn't even tell if it was a male or female driver in the uh, vehicle. They, they just see, they might see colors and shapes and contrast, but they cannot discern fine detail. And they are in our pedestrian population in significant numbers. Another key thing about them is that very few of them will use a cane. And so again, to us sighted individuals, they appear to be just an, another normal pedestrian on the sidewalk, but actually their visual capabilities are, are rather poor. So they depend on color contrast, textures, sounds for navigating the, the built environment. Of course, hearing can range from minor hearing impairments to total deafness, but we do rely on hearing when we're crossing a roadway, for example, whether we realize it or not. And the visually impaired rely very heavily on their hearing capabilities to see which tra or to hear which traffic stream is moving or not moving in terms of when they should cross the street. And then the last category of impairments is the cognitive or neurological impairments that relate to information processing and decision making. And these are pretty broad and can also vary in uh, severity. So it's a real challenge, I think, to uh, design and build for these sorts of impairments. But things like traumatic brain injuries, maybe that some of our veterans you know, fighting in Afghanistan or Iraq may come back with traumatic brain injuries. Uh, autism is a cognitive impairment, but of course autism can vary from relatively mild to rather severe cases. And so it, again, it's a real challenge to 
be able to accommodate the, the range of depths and breadth of this category. But we should keep in mind that these things that we do to comply with ADA really benefit everybody. I like to say everybody benefits from curb ramps, you know, uh, travelers with wheeled luggage, moms or dads pushing strollers in a neighborhood, they appreciate and need curb ramps, uh, delivery people with their wheeled carts, so everybody benefits. Also, a significant portion of the population does have some sort of disability. If you look at all age groups, I guess from birth to to old old age, in the United States, about 12 and a half percent of the population has a disability. The lowest rate, as you can see, is in Utah. The highest rate is where I am right now in West Virginia, almost 20% of the population. Uh, I know we have people from all over the country, so we couldn't have everybody, but uh, since Victoria and the Ohio LTAP were kind enough to ask me to do this, I've put Ohio rates here, and I know we have a number of folks from Ohio in attendance, but Ohio's rate is almost 14%, so it is a little bit above, above average. One thing to mention when you're looking at disability rates or proportions like this, it's important to look at the age category. If we were to look at the age group of 65 and above, that overall rate is probably 33 to 40%, depending on the state. So, and that's probably not surprising, right? As we age, our physical capabilities deteriorate, eyesight deteriorates, maybe mobility. And so it's probably not surprising that in the 65 and above, maybe a third or more of the population has some sort of disability. Another reason it's important that uh, many of us over our lives will have temporary disabilities, maybe an injury or surgery or some medical procedure that temporarily we may be in a wheelchair or have to use an assistive device or something like that. And so it helps those folks as well. And then just from an economic development, tourism standpoint, I, I talk to people all the time that want to you know, develop their community into sort of a retiree community, attract retirees to come to your community and, and live and spend their money. Uh, but of course, if we're gonna do that, as I just mentioned, a significant portion of retirees are going to have uh, these impairments or disabilities. So we need to make sure they can get out and about. And then last but not least, it is the law. And as we'll see, there are penalties and other things that are other consequences that are associated with not complying with the law. So maybe at this point, I'll stop. And I, do we have any questions, Victoria? Not right now, Ron. We're okay. doing good. OK, well, then we'll continue. I uh, would like to talk about some significant Court cases, again, this is not to threaten anybody, but just to show you what can happen if we don't take some of these things seriously. And these will be, this is just a small selection, but it is in chronological order. The first one, which is one of the more significant ones to those of us in public works, is the case of Kinney versus Jerusalem back in 1993 when the court rendered its uh, opinion. Uh, and this occurs in the city of Philadelphia. Of course, Philadelphia, historic city, with the Liberty Bell, Independence Hall, and other, other things. And Howard Jerusalem was the Pennsylvania DOT Secretary of Transportation at the time. The suit was against PennDOT and the city of Philadelphia. And apparently for many years, the city and the state, when they would resurface streets and roadways through the city, they did not apparently install or upgrade curb ramps as part of that work, even though people were complaining about and asking for curb ramps. And so Kinney uh, got to the point, well, you know, if you're not going to work with us, we'll take you to court. And so they filed this suit. And it's turned out to be significant to the public right of way. Uh, they probably the big thing was the court established a definition of an alteration. And we'll talk more about that later in more detail, probably tomorrow. But the bottom line is that when an agency resurfaces a roadway or street, 
that's considered an alteration and it triggers the requirement that the curb ramps be either installed if there were none or be brought up to current criteria as part of the project. And obviously that's significant to those of us in public works because this time of year, at least in a normal year, agencies are doing a lot of resurfacing in the summertime. And we'll talk more about that later. But the Kenny versus Jerusalem also addressed what's called the undue burden language. I don't know if anybody's heard that term or used it. It's really a legal term. But undue burden, I think if people say that, they mean it's too expensive and we can't afford to do that. And I've heard that argument applied quite a bit. Maybe some of you have heard that or even used it, that as part of a resurfacing project, we just can't afford to upgrade the curb ramps and pave the roadway. But one of the things that Kinney versus Jerusalem, the court said, was that last sentence there, notice that the cost of providing accessible ramps, meaning compliant curb ramps, is of no issue once an alteration is undertaken. So once you decided to resurface a road or a street, even if the curb ramp upgrade costs more than the paving project, that's not an issue. The curb ramps still need to be brought up to the current criteria. So that was obviously significant. Another one that maybe you've heard about is Barden versus the city of Sacramento. This is 2004 case. Apparently Sacramento as well, uh, apparently they would resurface streets and not upgrade the curb ramps. There were narrow sidewalks, there was vegetation overgrowing the sidewalk, uh, changes in level, maybe tree roots heaving up sidewalk slabs. They had steep cross slopes. Apparently some of their crosswalks were not accessible. And so Barden filed a suit against the city alleging these uh, you know, inaccessible features. And this, this did not go to trial. The, the parties reached an out-of-court settlement prior to trial. But notice here in the middle bullet, this is pretty significant. It was agreed that 20% of Sacramento's annual transportation budget for the next 30 years would be allocated to pedestrian accessibility. So think about that. That's sort of what would you call it? External control of your budget. And also think about what are there? They're only 16 years in, so they've still got 14 more years to go where a fifth of their transportation budget will go to pedestrian accessibility. But also notice upgrades to curb ramps as part of resurfacing projects are not included in that 20%. So this certainly had a significant impact on the, the public works budget and streets budget of the city of Sacramento. But a common theme about both of these, both the city of Sacramento and Kinney versus Jerusalem in Philadelphia, was that really the agencies were not responsive to the public you know, requests or complaints for uh, removing barriers, removing obstacles to movement. Then moving up to 2008, we have a case, Californians for Disability Rights, Inc., CDR versus Caltrans. Caltrans, of course, is the California DOT, the State Transportation Agency. And here the plaintiff said that Caltrans had failed to survey its 25,000 miles of sidewalks and therefore could not know what access barriers existed. Or to put that another way, the state did not do self-evaluation. That's the purpose of a self-evaluation as we'll talk about shortly, is to survey and to identify your barriers and obstacles. And then what the courts also said is that lack of a transition plan by itself is a violation of ADA. So it's important that agencies have an up-to-date transition plan. And I, I'm not going to ask, a, but if there's agencies represented here in the audience that don't have a transition plan, my recommendation would be to get started on that as soon as possible. I mean, even this afternoon, if you can. Or actually, what I would do is part of a transition plan is you know, training, training of staff. So 
the fact that you're here this morning, signed up for this session, uh, that shows a good faith effort to understand this process. So claim this session this morning, your attendance here as the beginning part of your transition plan. But they, they are important, especially now that we're at the 30th anniversary. I think maybe, you know, FHWA and others may be taking a closer look at do agencies actually have a transition plan prepared and is it up to date? And then in 2009, we also have another Californians for Disability Rights case against Caltrans. I'm not going to read all this, but I just wanted you to see the magnitude here of what was determined in this case that Caltrans will need to spend over a billion dollars over 30 years addressing curb ramps and sidewalks, audible signals, crosswalks, and even temporary pedestrian routes, meaning when there's construction, maintenance, or utility work on a sidewalk, they needed to address that as well. So these are significant, and I mentioned earlier kind of the difference between a tort claim and a civil rights claim, but I think you can see here in these civil rights matters, one of the things that can happen that won't happen in a tort claim is that the courts or DOJ will sort of take this external control of your budget and they'll uh, determine how funding will be allocated. The DOJ also has something called Project Civic Access where they will go around the country, uh, maybe a few states or a few locations a year, and they will do kind of a detailed review of, as you see here, the buildings and building sites in a community or a county. Uh, they'll look at the public right of way, they'll look at parking, but they'll also look at things like communications, like the agency's website, signage around your buildings or in your buildings. And the ultimate goal is so that counties, cities, and towns bring their facilities into compliance. Uh, maybe some of you in the audience have had a visit with Project Civic Access. Uh, if, if you're interested, if you just Google DOJ Project Civic Access, the website shows you everywhere the, the DOJ has been in, in all 50 states. And just as an example, I just picked three here just to give you an example or flavor for what they might do. The first one is DOJ versus City of Frederick, Maryland. Frederick, Maryland is northwest of Washington, D.C., probably just on the fringe of the D.C. metro area, about 66,000 population. They had some serious issues with curb ramps at intersections, and they were given 30 months to fix all their curb ramps for, that were altered since January of 1992. Another one is DOJ versus the town of Warrington, Virginia. Warrington's in central Virginia, see a little under 10,000 population. They were given three years to fix their curb ramps. And also notice in their training, I hate to think of training as a penalty as somebody who does training, but in this case, DOJ said as part of you know, the penalty, if you will, that they levied on Warrington was they required that employees undergo appropriate training. And that training is going to vary depending on what the employees do. For example, the the people in the office, maybe the I don't know about Warrington, but let's say Warrington has also has the water department that may deal with customers paying their water bill or addressing issues with their water bill. Those personnel that deal with the customers, they might need customer service training. They probably don't need right of way training. But on the other hand, the crews that are out on the roads and streets, the concrete crews or the maintenance crews, those are signing and marking crews. They probably need training more oriented toward the public works, public rights of way aspect of ADA. So the training needs to be appropriate to what people do. And then my last example is in here because sometimes people will tell me, well, my community is so small, we don't have to worry about this. Nobody will find us. Well, this is DOJ versus Craig County, Virginia. The whole county only has 5,200 people. It's in rural southwestern Virginia. But DOJ came in under Project Civic Access and examined their uh, facilities. 
and they apparently had issues with curb ramps at buildings, maybe the county library, county courthouse, and so forth. And so they were given one to three years to fix those ramps. So the sum is notice there's penalties, there's fees, and then there's that external control of priorities that are some of the consequences that can apply if we don't take this seriously. So here's another West Virginia community. And I, I was not there for the paving operation, but you can see that this street was recently resurfaced. I would guess that it was probably done within two weeks before I got there to take this photograph. And if you remember Kinney versus Jerusalem, when a street is resurfaced, the curb ramps need to be brought into compliance as part of that project because resurfacing is considered an alteration. Well, we have a curb ramp here, but it doesn't look too compliant to me. Notice there's no detectable warning surface, nor is there any level landing, which is critical for when one is turning a wheelchair or turning a walker, in this case, to cross the street. Uh, I mentioned earlier, if you ever get a chance to get in a manual wheelchair, you should do it. This is one of the things you should try to do is try to turn a wheelchair going up or down a grade like this. And it is not a trivial task, it's a very taxing task. So it is important to have a level turning space. So that should have been done. Those improvements should have been done as part of this paving project. But also, if we look closely, I'm not sure the ramp is even accessible because notice it, this is main street of this community out here on the upper right. So this would be the sidewalk along main street, which would be a pretty important sidewalk in terms of pedestrian movement. Uh, but notice that with this lamp post, and with this column here and part of the structure, I don't think somebody in a wheelchair can actually even get to the curb ramp via the sidewalk. It appears that they might be able to enter this vestibule or whatever we want to call it here behind the you can see the bicycle park there and get to the ramp this way but that appears to involve using private property as part of your accessible route which may be okay if you make appropriate arrangements but what happens if the ownership changes or if the building is reconfigured or something like that that may adversely affect how people can access this ramp. So there's there's actually a number of issues at this location. Any questions up to this point? Victoria, do, any questions come in? That was perfect timing, Ron. I was just going to send you a message to tell you I had a few. Okay. So the first one is, does PROAG address how to determine if sidewalks are required in a particular neighborhood? Good, excellent question. Actually, PROAG or ADA does not require us to install sidewalks. What they do say, of course, is that if we install sidewalks, we need to make sure that they are constructed to the appropriate criteria and that they're maintained in accessible condition. And so that raises a good question. And I probably should have said at the outset, uh, a couple things. One is that, uh, rightly or wrongly, ADA is not a zero one or yes or no type of uh, topic. It's most of it is a gray area, and I know that's frustrating to engineers and technicians and other people who like things more clear cut. But ADA is a gray area. The other thing I would say is that. This whole field as well is very context sensitive. For example, what might work for a curb ramp design on a, say a street corner in the city of Cleveland, Ohio, might not work on a similar street corner in Cincinnati, Ohio, just because of differences perhaps in right of way or utilities or topography or that sort of thing, or even what might work on a street corner in Cleveland on one side of the city might not work on a similar street corner on the other side of the city, again, because of differences in topography 
Maybe in one case, you have a historic building next to the sidewalk. There may be drainage issues. Uh, and in fact, it's fair to say that what might work on one, say on the northwest corner of an intersection in Cleveland, might not work on the southeast corner, which is diagonally across the street from it. Again, because of differences in topography, uh, utilities, drainage, and what have you. So you really have to look at each location individually in its specific context uh, to answer or to determine your design. So I say that because if some of you ask questions about a specific location, which I hope you do, I'm not trying to discourage that, but my answer might be, it depends. And I'm not trying to put you down or not trying to be a smart aleck, but we, the answer really does depend on the specific circumstances. So let me get back to that question that was asked and ask you to maybe imagine something. Maybe you have a community and maybe uh, maybe an area on the outskirts of the community where you're kind of you know in the fringe area where you're going from uh, the built up area maybe into farmland or, or wooded area and maybe in what had been farmland maybe in the next year or two you're going to put in a new subdivision and maybe between that farmland where the subdivision will go and the town is maybe a small wooded area. And so a question might be, do I need to put a sidewalk from, you know, say from town, the edge of town there to this new subdivision? And that's where it really does depend. Uh, let me give sort of two extremes. One might be, let's say you go out there or you're familiar with that area and maybe you've never really seen pedestrians walking along the road at that wooded area. And if you look along the road, there's no goat paths you know in the grass or in the weeds there along the road and so i would say and i'm just giving you sort of my thinking process here i would say it looks to me like there's really right now there's no pedestrian demand here so i'm going to make the decision not to put a sidewalk here for right now and i I'd, I'd document that but let's say i was out there doing that same sort of thing and maybe in the half hour while I was out there examining the area, maybe I see a couple pedestrians walk along the side of the road. Or maybe I get out of my car and I look alongside the road and there's kind of a well-worn goat path there where it's evidence people are walking, you know, in enough to wear down the grass, wear out the grass there. And so to me, that's evidence of pedestrian activity. So in that second case, I would probably call for a sidewalk there, even though you know, under PROAG, we don't have to. But in that second case, because there is evidence of pedestrian activity, personally, I would probably put a sidewalk there. Other questions? Okay, there's one I think is referring to a picture that you might have had up. It says, is it too far from the cross street stop line would have to be far back? So, I. I read that off. I don't know if it's a reference to a picture you had up. Maybe they can. Yeah, I, wonder, some... I wonder if they were referring to this one. Well, Betty will have to comment and let us know. I'll go on to the next question and then um, Betty can provide us uh, some additional comments. Well, maybe, question... Can I use this one, Victoria? Just because I think. Oh, he, maybe he, yes, one. that's that picture. Yes. Okay. She can find it. Thanks. Yeah. Does everybody see that? Notice because of where the curb ramp and the crosswalk is here. The stop line, which would be over here on the far left, you can see my cursor. The stop line is pretty darn far back from the intersection, right? That And that's not a good thing. And I'm not sure why this municipality didn't have the crosswalk just be the extension of the sidewalk here on, on Main Street. But yeah, that's another uh, problem here is that the stop line is just so far back from the, the intersection. And was there a question associated with that, Victoria? No, I think that was just a, a comment that was made. Yeah, so. I would agree with that comment, definitely. Okay, and then um, the next one that was a question. If local ordinance requires sidewalk to be maintained by the adjacent owner, is the city still required to upgrade the ramps when resurfacing? Uh, in my opinion, yes. Yes. Yeah, because even in cases, and again, I'm an, an engineer, not an attorney, but 
I have taught classes from time to time with attorneys in the civil rights area who work with PROAG and ADAG. And the impression they've given me is that not only at the corners, but even say in the middle of a, a block, if you have a big maple tree heaving up the sidewalk slab, and if, there, if someone filed an ADA complaint, and it, you may have ordinances that say it's the property owner's responsibility to fix that, I think ultimately DOJ would say that liability falls on the, the municipality or the city or the town because this is part of the public right of way. And certainly at curb ramps, I think the same thing would apply. The DOJ would expect that the it would be the governmental entity that would need to, to make sure there's accessible curb ramps and an accessible sidewalk between those curb ramps. Okay, Ron, I can just keep going with these questions. So you let me know when you need to keep moving. Well, have, let me keep moving. And I think we'll have time at the end for some questions. All right, I've got plenty of them. Thanks. Okay, good. Keep the questions coming. So now let's look at self-evaluation, which is sort of the first step in this self-evaluation transition plan process. Just some... Uh, legalese here, I guess, if you will, these are required of all public agencies or all public entities. Notice the due date was January of 1993. So hopefully everybody complied with that. But what's required is that public agencies need to evaluate their current services, policies, and practices and evaluate the effects thereof that do not or may not meet ADA. So to put it kind of in public works terminology, we need to identify barriers and obstacles to accessibility in the public right of way, like a heaved up sidewalk slab, like I said, or a lack of a curb ramp. But one thing I wanna emphasize is that in this session that we're doing here, that I'm doing, I'm focusing on the public right of way but an agency doing a self-evaluation would have to look at all its programs, services, and facilities. So you'd have to look at City Hall, and maybe, maybe there's a step to the front door of City Hall so that someone in a wheelchair can't get into to City Hall. That would be the type of barrier that would also need to be part of the self-evaluation. So everybody clear on that? I'm gonna focus on the public right-of-way, but an agency would have to look at all its programs, services, and facilities or maybe to the door to the city council chambers, maybe on the second floor of your city building, maybe has a lip that's a half inch high and someone in a wheelchair can't get into the attend a council meeting. That's the same sort of thing that would have to be identified in a self-evaluation, but I'm just gonna focus on the public right of way. So here's a scene from Pennsylvania, a small city in Pennsylvania. This big brick building here is a, is the, high school in the city. The cornerstone when I was there said it was built in 1929, so it's pretty old. Uh, in recent years, they added an addition over here on the left side to the building and a big parking lot just out of sight here on the left. So this is a brand new driveway that was built when they built the new parking lot and that was all done as part of the addition to the back of the high school. But what do you think there? And there had been, for decades, there had been a sidewalk along this street here. But notice this. I don't know if this was a design or construction issue, but wouldn't you agree somebody dropped the ball? That The nose of that island should have ended or should have been back here. Now this island obstructs that sidewalk such that even able-bodied pedestrians and people in wheelchairs and walkers have to go into the street to continue on the sidewalk. I mean, not only is that an accessibility issue, that's a safety issue to me. Maybe safety is a bigger issue here than accessibility because someone can still get around it, but to get around it, they have to expose themselves to traffic conflicts. And then also, and we'll talk more about this uh, probably next week, but there, it's hard to see, there is a sidewalk here and it ramps up and there's a sidewalk that goes around the perimeter of the parking lot that you can't see here. So this is a ramp here. You just see a small portion of it. Uh, the designer maybe had some ADA training but maybe didn't appreciate the finer points. 
the designer put a detectable warning surface or truncated dome pad here. We'll talk more about this, but these, to a blind and low vision pedestrian, these are hazard alerting mechanisms. It tells the visually impaired pedestrian that they are about to cross a street or a road or a railroad or something like that. But notice here, there is no immediate street crossing. They're not at the street here. They still have, what's that, maybe 10 feet to get to the street. And actually, I would argue this is the middle of the block. And there's no marked crosswalk here. I don't want pedestrians, especially blind pedestrians, crossing in the middle of the block. So this is really an extraneous uh, detectable warning surface here. There's no need for that surface. And it can be potentially confusing to a blind or low vision pedestrian. And I see that on Fortsy quite a bit. And we'll, that's why I say on the, uh, our last day of the session here, we will look in fair amount of detail at detectable warnings. So now we're still talking about self-evaluations, but we're kind of grading into, or transitioning into, no pun intended, into transition plans. So after you've identified your obstacles and barriers, then you make a plan for removing, remediating, getting rid of those obstacles or barriers. And that's the transition plan. And we'll talk about that next time. But one key thing I wanted to mention, as part of this self-evaluation process, you have to provide opportunities for public participation. And more specifically than that, not just public participation, which is important, but you also have to make sure that you reach out to individuals with disabilities and organizations that represent individuals with disabilities. And that is an important part of this process. And that has to be documented that you made a proactive effort to reach out not only to the public in general, but specifically to individuals with disabilities and organizations associated with folks with disabilities. Uh, you may recall on the poll, polling question that Victoria put up early on, Maybe you'd never seen that before. The, I broke the local government down into those with 50 or more employees, which I think is our main audience today, and those with less than 50 employees. And the reason I did that, of course, is that's the breakdown that's used here in ADA. And ADA makes the distinction public agencies employing 50 or more and those with less than 50. And when I say 50 or more, that's all employees. So if, if your agency maybe hires you know, students, college student uh, workers during the summer, temporary employees, whatever you might call them, they count toward that 50 employees. And it's total in the whole agency. It's not just in the streets department or in the public works department, it's the entire city. So that would parks and rec or you know your finance offices, everything. It's the total number of employees in the agency. So we'll look first at those agencies that employ 50 or more. They have to not only do a self-evaluation, but it has to be maintained on file and made available for inspection. These days, you, know, you may want to post it on your, on your website. And so you have to have a list of who you consulted. So that should include, remember I said earlier, the, the, not only the public, but groups and people with disabilities. Describe the area you examined and the problems you identified. So if you're with a town or city, the area would be everything within your corporate limits that you're responsible for. And then again, this is kind of grading into the transition plan, but then a description of the modifications that need to be made to remove that obstacle. So for example, if it's a tree root heaving up a sidewalk slab, you might say we need to remove the existing concrete maybe you know, hack out some of the tree roots and then replace the slab so that the slabs are flush. Or if a curb ramp is missing at an intersection, the description might be you know, install curb ramp, two curb ramps on this corner. And then, as I said, that's all sort of part of the transition plan, which we will talk about next time. What if your agency has less than 50 employees? You still have to do a self-evaluation ADA says it should be documented, and notice I highlighted should there, because I, 
I do some forensic engineering work and I, I'm not sure how an agency can sort of prove or demonstrate that they have done a self-evaluation unless there's some documentation. I, mean, I was thinking about this yesterday. I guess, you know, somebody in the city, like a council person could do a self-evaluation, but if it's not documented, it would be in their head. And what happens if the council person you know, is not reelected or, you know, hope it wouldn't happen, but you know, it's run down by a bus or something, then all that information is lost. So I'm not sure how you can say you, you have a plan or a, uh, have done an evaluation without having it documented. So personally, I would think it has to be documented, but uh, ADA just calls it a should, a recommendation. I guess the big thing is it doesn't have to be quite as big a deal as, as your larger communities or entities would do. Just as I say there, something that substantiates, you know your barriers, where they are, what they are, and you're working to correct them. I mentioned the public outreach programs. Uh, the second bullet to me is important, and I'll use my dad as an example. I think we need to give people a variety of mechanisms for participating in the process, the self-evaluation transition plan process. And I'll use my dad as an example because he, he, I won't call him an activist, but he'd like to, you know, if there was a particular issue in his community, he would like to offer comments. So he sometimes would write letters to the editors or would send letters to his community, to the mayor or council people, giving his opinion on certain things. But at some point, as he got older, he developed a tremor in his right hand and he was right dominant. So it, it got so bad that he couldn't even sign his name anymore. And so actually, to his credit, he was probably one of the first people to do online banking and online bill paying and things because he could use a keyboard. He was adept at word processing, so he would just you know, word process a letter to the mayor or something. But then as time went on, his tremor got so bad that he couldn't even use a keyboard because his arm was just shaking so bad. And one week or so, something, an issue came up in his community where the, uh, the city was asking for input. And he wanted to input, but the public notice that was online or in the newspaper said all comments had to be in writing. And so he called the, the city and he said, I want to comment, but I can't write, I can't word process. But if somebody could just you know, listen to me, they said, I don't have many comments, but if someone could just listen to me and transcribe my comments, I'll be able to participate. And believe it or not, that he was told no, that the comments had to be in writing. Personally, I think that's an ADA violation right there. He was not allowed to participate because he couldn't write. And he, he never pursued anything like that. But that's the thing we want to avoid. We have to recognize that not everybody can write. Not everybody can speak or hear. You know, So we need to make sure that we give people a variety of mechanisms for participating in the process. So meeting transcriptions or some transcription service or uh, phone lines, emails, mail, whatever it might be, but give people a variety of opportunities and ways to participate. This could be anywhere USA probably, right? Now how about that? Before the session started, Victoria and I were talking about the issues faced by utility poles. How about this one? This, get bonus points, I guess. Here we have double utility poles side by side. So clearly there's not a four foot clear space where even an able-bodied pedestrian can walk around that corner there. They have to go into the street. And then notice the signal controller box on, mounted on the pole. That is at a height, and we'll talk more about this probably next week, but this is at a height where it cannot be detected by someone using a cane. So actually someone using a cane, if they're sort of along, if they're using this brick storefront here as their shoreline and staying close to the store line, to the store, uh, they are going to run into that signal controller box before they detect it. The, the term for that is protruding object. 
It's something that protrudes into the pedestrian circulation area at a height that is above the cane detection height. And so that's a serious issue as well. That's a safety issue as well. And what we might do here, uh, this is just one way, this is not the only way, but one thing we can do to resolve that, uh, well, two things we can do. One thing, of course, is we could have a ground mounted controller box so that it's not elevated like that, but that's probably expensive to do. But one thing we could do is put maybe a five inch high curb in the footprint of that controller box, directly under the box, so it wouldn't be a tripping hazard. But by putting a curb under there, now that controller box is detectable. The blind pedestrian's cane will hit that curb and they'll realize they can't proceed straight through this, this area. Well, obviously they still have issues trying to get around that, that pole. So this, this is not a good situation. So here you, you do have, maybe some of you have read it already, maybe not, but uh, I would like to give you a little homework assignment for tomorrow. And that is one of the files you have is the Village of Lyons, New York transition plan, their ADA transition plan. And tomorrow we're going to discuss that as a case study. So if you would, it probably will take you maybe 10 or 12 minutes to read. If you would read that before class tomorrow, I'd appreciate it. I realize folks may have been, you know, work and family obligations, but if so, maybe, you know, maybe try to log on 15 minutes early tomorrow morning and while you're waiting for Victoria and I to come on at, at 10 o'clock, maybe read the transition plan during that time. Uh, one thing I want to note to be clear about is, because uh, sometimes I get questions of where can I get a good sort of model transition plan. And I don't mean to embarrass or put down the village of lions. Uh, we're just using this kind of in the spirit of learning and education to see what lessons we can learn. But the transition plan you have is not a model transition plan. The reason I picked it is because it has some things that we can critique and talk about and hopefully learn some lessons from that. But if you would read that by tomorrow, I'd appreciate it. Also, one of the handouts you have is a two or three page resource list that has a number of links related to ADA and PROAG and transition plans. And also to, I also mentioned the uh, ADA national network. There's a network of regions around the country and uh, they are a great resource when it comes to ADA. So if you're not familiar with that, uh, you can see from the map on the handout which region you're in and uh, find that your region, find their website and get become familiar with the resources that they offer. So with that, I think we have some time left for questions and we still have questions coming in, Victoria. We do, Ron. Um, let me get to the first one here. It says, will you be talking about requirements for audible traffic signals over the next week? Yes, next uh, Thursday in our last session, we will talk about that. And the next question, do all street corners require a ramp even if there is no crosswalk? <laughs> Good question. And the answer is, not to be a wise guy, the answer is it depends. If there is a, let's say it's in town and it's a street corner and on the other corner is another built up corner and a sidewalk, maybe through a residential area. Yes, you definitely need to have a curb ramp, even if the crosswalk is not marked. Although if you, I forget the exact wording, but if you mark a crosswalk, then you really have to be sure that you have accessible compliant curb ramps on either side, because that, that's a serious ADA issue. If you have a marked crosswalk, but no ramps or non-compliant ramps, but let me give another situation. I'm not sure this is what the person was asking. But remember, earlier I talked about sort of a situation on the edge of town. Let's go back to that again. Let's say you have a corner on the edge of town, and maybe there's sidewalks on both streets that come together. So the, the sidewalks meet at right angles. And maybe there's homes behind those sidewalks. But let's say on the other side of the street is just is a farm field, and there's no sidewalk. 
a question then comes up, do I need curb ramps at that corner I'm talking about that has the sidewalks? And that's one of the gray areas. And there's really two schools of thought. And I think both are correct. But uh, one school of thought would say, well, there's no sidewalk on the other side of the street. And maybe the road is narrow. Maybe there's really no shoulder. And so I would think in my thinking process, do I really want to send someone in a wheelchair out onto that roadway? They're going to have to be in the traveled way to, you know, to proceed further down that roadway. And I might make the decision, no, I don't want them in the roadway at that location. So I would basically make sure that that corner where the sidewalks intersected, that there was a detectable end to the sidewalk, like meaning a grass strip around that whole corner so that someone would never get to the, the curb. And that way I'm saying there's not an accessible route beyond that point. But another school of thought, and I have to admit, I'm more and more, I guess, moving to this uh, belief myself. Another school of thought would say, well, it's possible that someone may be in the roadway there on the outskirts of town in a wheelchair, and we need to give them the opportunity to get to the sidewalk. And so they would put a curb ramp in at that corner, even though there's no crosswalk or not even a sidewalk on the other side of the, the street. So I don't know, I just wanted to share my thinking on that. That's one of those gray areas where I don't know that you know one is right or one is wrong, but uh, I think whatever I would do is I would, again, document, 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 document your thought process of why you decided to put a ramp there or why you decided not to. But remember, if you don't put a ramp there, there needs to be a detectable end of the sidewalk for the visually impaired because they can detect that curve when they get there and they think that they can just proceed straight ahead but if there's no sidewalk or really no shoulder on the other side of the street my thought would be i'm not sure i want to have visually impaired pedestrians proceeding that way but if there's a grass strip around the sidewalk they can detect that with their cane and realize that they have to turn say left there or or maybe there is a curb ramp crossing the other other roadway. Okay, Ron, I know we're getting close to stopping time, so it's up to you if you want to take this last question. And it's actually a couple people have asked it. Um, is there a specific time frame on when um, evaluations should be done, like the frequency for those? Good question. And that question is good lead into next class too, because some people ask that same question about uh, transition plans that they need to be updated, but people ask how often. I would say, uh, I want to make sure I get my wording right. You know, every three years at worst, or if you, you know, if you can do it every year or two, that'd be great, but no worse than every three years, I would say. Do, do your self-evaluation or update your transition plan. That, that's one of those gray areas too. You won't see anything in writing about that, but if, if you talk to people, especially legal counsel for agencies of all sizes, as I travel the country, that seems to be a number that, that attorneys agree on, that if you do it no worse than every three years, that, that that would meet the requirement of sort of periodic or regular updating of your self-evaluation or your transition plan. Okay, well, I, we are right up on 1130, so I want to thank you so much for the excellent start to this webinar series. It's going to complete a course for all of us, and we will be sending the questions that we didn't have time for over to Ron for him to review before our session tomorrow. So please make sure you get your homework done if you've got some time. Ron, is there anything else you wanted to add? No, I just want to thank everybody for participating and for the great questions and look forward to hearing from everyone tomorrow. Absolutely. All right. We will see everyone on their, the call tomorrow. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye.